Mutiny on the Bounty. Compressed into those four words is one of the most tragic stories in the history of the British Navy. It is the year 1787. From England sails a gallant little ship, barely 90 feet long. Her destination is the almost legendary island of Tahiti in the dark waters of the vast unknown South Seas. Her mission is to transplant the breadfruit tree to the West Indies as food for slaves on the great plantation. Her commander, Lieutenant William Bly, was a stern and righteous man. Alternately smashed by giant storms and becalmed for weeks, Bly drove his ship on and on with naval discipline so rigorous that finally the half-starved, half-mad crew mutinied under the leadership of the young mate, a strange and brooding man, Fletcher Christian. Casting Bly adrift in a small boat with 18 of his loyal men, the bounty returned to Tahiti, where the mutineers succumbed to the blandishments of the beautiful island. Many of them married native women, including Fletcher Christian himself, but now his cooler judgment was in command of his emotion. He was guilty of mutiny and piracy on the high seas. He knew that sooner or later the long arm of England would reach out even to Tahiti and snatch the mutineers back to hang them by their necks until they were dead, dead, dead. So again the bounty sailed, searching for some unknown island where the mutineers could hide forever from avenging justice, hoping never to see a strange white face again. Pitcairn, lost in the trackless Pacific, uninhabited, Far south of known waters, it was an ideal haven. Haven, it was a fortress guarded by a girdle of savage coral reefs. To this desolate rock came the bounty, carrying nine white mutineers and six brown men and 12 brown women of Tahiti, who had cast their lots in with the Englishmen to bury themselves in oblivion. Their hearts quailed at the sight of Pitcairn, but Christian relentlessly drove them on. Surely it was magnificent seamanship, plus his desperate courage, that enabled him to navigate the bounty to a safe anchorage. For to this day, the island is fringed with a gaunt necklace of wreckage, a hundred-year record of countless ships which once graced the seven seas, only to come to doom and destruction on Pitcairn, leaving their skeletons to be picked clean by the relentless sea on Pitcairn's treacherous rocks. Here, Christian stripped the ship of all that might help the survival of 27 people who would never see civilization again. Then he burned and sank the bounty so that it should not betray him. Today, the rare traveler who comes to Pitcairn may look down into a clear lagoon and see some charred and rotting planks, some bits of rusty iron. All that remains of his majesty ship, the bounty, whispering her story endlessly with only the moss and the coral to listen. For 20 years, the fate of the bounty was blank mystery to the world. Then a little whaling vessel stumbled onto Pitcairn. They found it strangely inhabited by a race of half-caste people. Only one of the mutineers was alive. Bloody battles over possession of the women had brought the others to frightful deaths. So that today, Pitcairn with its 52 families is little changed. Adamstown, its only village, sprawls awkwardly on a ledge 500 feet above the sea. The sea, from which came all that Pitcairn has, its people, even its homes, clumsily put together out of the wreckage of ships. Here life moves on lazily, untouched by the joys, the cares, or the treacheries of the world outside. Here live, by their own choice, the descendants of the original settlers, in primitive and barely self-sufficient banishment. Goat House Mountain, where, in a cave far above the sea, the moody Fletcher Christian spent long morose hours alone, avoiding the others in their little village, dreading the sight of a sail which might bring retribution, and brooding darkly over the tragic fate his impetuous action had brought to his shipmates. But the Pitcairn Islander today little resembles his romantic ancestors. Neither the lusty bodies of those British mutineers nor the handsome features of their Tahitian wives could survive a century and a half of intermarriage. Here is Fletcher Christian's great-grandson, William Christian, cultivating Pitcairn's stubborn soil. The village blacksmith, Benjamin Young, great-grandson of a happy young midshipman of the bounty. At 84, Benjamin's mind is still keen, his hand deft. The vice he works at came from the bounty and still does yeoman service 150 years later. Edward Christian hews a tombstone from a rock washed smooth by the waves. Soon it will take its place among the crude monuments marking the graves of the misguided men who committed the great, the unforgivable crime of the high sea. Andy Warren, grandson of a whaler who came to Pitcairn 60 years ago and decided to stay. 
only survivor of the bounty, when the world discovered Pitcairn, John Adams had repented of his crime, and in the hope of expiating his sin, had brought religion to the women and children, teaching them Christianity, giving his life to his newfound God, so that today religious observance is strictly insisted on, and Sunday has become the holiest of holy days. On this day, three church services are held. Still devout followers of the Church of England, the islanders pooled all their efforts to erect this church as a temple of their faith. No great and shining cathedral in all the world is holier than this little house, for into its construction went not only tender care, but cruel labor. Every timber in the church of Pitcairn was cut on another island 200 miles away. Pastor Christian, beloved shepherd of the flock, is also the Beau Brummel of Pitcairn. Roy Clark, Dora Warren, Aunt Annie McCoy. A William McCoy was an able-bodied seaman on the bounty. Sunday afternoon, and lovers go strolling, as lovers will do. And if the young man hasn't a penny in his pocket, it doesn't matter. There's nothing on Pitcairn he can buy for his sweetheart. School is out, but to the lucky children of Pitcairn, school is almost always out. Two hours a day before breakfast for classes, and the rest of the time for play. But there are no toy shops, and if a girl wants a doll to play with, she has to make it for herself. Lucky children? No, perhaps not so lucky after all. Exercise is compulsory. For, weakened by generations of inbreeding, these lads can maintain their health and mental capabilities only by making every form of exercise a daily ritual. But no one has to coax the boys to indulge their favorite exercise, swimming. For the sea, often so cruel to Pitcairn, has relented to carve in the jagged rocks the Pacific's version of the old swimming hole. Through a great gash, the blue water surges constantly to freshen what is probably the most fantastic swimming pool in the world. Even on Pitcairn, Rebecca carries her pitcher to fill at the well. Her long, tawny tresses were bequeathed her by Midshipman Young eight generations ago. She's never seen a thermos bottle, but museums would pay its weight in gold for that jar she carries. It came from the bounty. Pitcairn's newspaper, its circulation 100% of the population, and all on one copy. The shy bridegroom wears his best church-going uniform, and the bridal gown, for once, is not an imported creation. But the society editor of Pitcairn could truthfully write that the wedding was attended by everyone of importance, and that the bridal party following the happy couple was a picture more brilliant than has ever been witnessed in our fair city. Sometimes stark tragedy, tragedy peculiar to Pitcairn, strikes cruelly. Yes, such wireless as it is, limited in range and dubious of efficiency, it may, and then again it may not, reach out through the night as far as a passing ship. If a steamer hears, it may bring a hope of life to the stricken baby and its heart-sick mother. The primitive beacon light is probably much more likely to be effectual. All night the ready volunteers tend it frantically, watching, waiting, hoping. And then comes morning with its blessed answer to their prayers. A ship, it is seen, it has come to help. And from that God sent ship, a boat, a doctor, a baby's life saved. And babies are important, even in the lost frontier of the South Pacific. Pitcairn Island, strange, unreal whimsy of fate, spawned by the violence and hatred of the mutineers on His Majesty's ship, the Bounty, 150 years ago.